is a project that, um, there's no place to put this water, I'll just put it down here somewhere, uh, uh, that I've been working on for um, maybe five or six, seven years now. And um, I'm, I'm collaborating, as, as, as Matthew mentioned, with uh, some young people at uh, Cambridge and Notre Dame and Baylor and other places uh, who fortunately know more physics than I do. So they, they provide the physics and I, I provide the metaphysics and the history and that sort of thing. Uh, but I did want to come talk to you about it because I think it's, it's, it's quite important, actually, um, because uh, Aristotle's philosophy was really the groundwork for Western thought for a very long time. And, and I think in many ways paved the way for the Christian gospel to transform the ancient world in the way that it did. And so since in the last 300, 400 years, we've been living in a post-Aristotelian world in which science supposedly has shown Aristotle to be completely obsolete. And that's changed the intellectual climate, the world we lived in. Uh, so the good news I have tonight is that, that climate is changing back, that Aristotle is coming back in a big way. And the, the reason that, that that's happening is because of the, this, quant, this quantum revolution in physics, which has happened oh, over 100 years ago now, began to happen. But it's only now I think that philosophers are just beginning to understand uh, what that revolution was all about. And um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that as that happens, we're going to get uh, a, a clearer picture of, of nature and of our place in it as a result. So Aristotle's philosophy of nature is one in which there's a relationship between parts and wholes that's very different from the way we are thinking about things in the modern world. So in the modern world, we think of uh, wholes as dependent on parts. Parts are the fundamentally real thing, really, really small things like atoms and particles. And then once you've solved that, you've solved everything, right? I mean, the wholes are just built up from those parts in, in obvious sorts of ways. Um, that is what we might call a physicalist, or a, I like to call it a microphysicalist uh, model of the world. And Aristotle provides us quite a different picture in which you have fundamentally real things that exist at numbers of different scale. So not just at the microscopic level, but at the mesoscopic level of, of, uh, of chemical and thermodynamic substances, at the level of organisms and persons as well. And so um, that, I think, is, is why, the, why the Aristotelian counter-revolution that I'm pushing for anyway is going to be a significant thing if, it, if indeed it does happen. So the, um, let's see, I think I've covered that pretty well. Let me go ahead and go on to my next slide. Let me give you the overview of what I'm going to say tonight. Um, first of all, I'm going to give you a picture. Again, this is going to be a very historical introduction to what, what we're doing. So I want to tell you a little bit about, the, about Aristotle's vision of nature and then talk about the anti-Aristotelian revolution that happens in the 17th century, 18th century. Uh, and then finally, the, then thirdly, the counter-revolution, the quantum counter-revolution that's happened roughly 100 years ago, how that's reversed what happened, really, in many ways, with the anti-Aristotelian um, movement. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll suggest where, we, where the future is going to take us. And it's going to go back to the past, back to Aristotle in many ways. So, uh, so let's start with uh, Aristotle's image of nature. And I'm going to talk about four basic elements of Aristotle's. Now, for many of you, this may be um, very uh, elementary, and, uh, uh, and I apologize if that's the case, but uh, I did want to make sure that we were all on the same page here as far as what, what are the key elements of Aristotle's picture of the world. So I'm going to talk a little about formal and material causation in Aristotle, uh, causal powers and change, teleology or final causation, intrinsic ends, and then real agency that occurs at multiple levels, all that are part of Aristotle's picture. And I'm looking here mostly at his physics and, and his metaphysics, or the main sources for, for, my, for these ideas. So in Aristotle, the matter of a thing is, you know, consists of its parts or components. And uh, so the matter of a mixture is the elements that make it up. The matter of an organism is the various discrete parts that make up that organism. But on Aristotle's picture, there's no such thing as matter as such. Matter is a relative notion, the matter of something. And uh, the matter as such, sometimes called prime matter, exists merely as a kind of idealization or abstraction for Aristotle. It's not, it's not one of the fundamental building blocks of the world. Now, in Aristotle's picture, there are two kinds of explanation, formal and material. Material is the kind that we're more familiar with, a bottom-up sort of explanation, explaining holes in terms of their parts. But there's an equal and equally important, and perhaps more important, in fact, uh, formal explanation, which goes from holes down to parts. It's top-down. So to give the formal cause of a thing is to give its essence, to tell, you, to tell what it is to be that sort of thing. And the essence 
even composite things can have essences in this way. And the essence of a composite thing will be something that determines the natures and the mutual relations of the parts that make up that thing. So the essence of each part, in a sense, you might say, depends on the essence of the whole in which it, in which, in which it participates. Right? It's, not, it's not the other way around. So to be flesh, for instance, well, to, let's be, to, to be a heart, for instance, is to be an organ in a whole that serves certain functions of that whole organism, right, that pumps the blood through the circulatory system. To be flesh is to be organic material that participates in the organic functions in a certain way. To be a gene, right, I mean, we might think we're way past Aristotle, but to be a gene is to be a part of a DNA molecule that codes for the production of certain proteins, right? So, so you can't exp understand what a gene is just from the bottom up to understand the components of the DNA molecule. You have to understand what it's doing in the larger organism. So once we have the uh, formal and material causation uh, in picture, okay, so I was just talking about this, um, the, um, the form, is, again, makes the thing be the kind of thing it is. And it also confers a set of active and passive powers on the whole. So the form is the ultimate explanation for, for change and for rest, for non-change within the organism. Uh, and finally, the um, material composition, the material causation of the right kind is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for the true being of a thing. So in order to have an organism of the right kind, to have an organism, a human being, you have to have the right sort of materials. Right? You can't make a human being out of tin or something like that. It has to be made of the right sort of materials. But having the right materials and even putting them in the right sort of arrangement is not, is not sufficient to produce an organism. It's only a necessary condition. That's the crucial thing. So, um, so the, the, I guess I'm on to the next slide. Yeah, so this brings us then to the next notion within Aristotle's picture, and that's the idea of causal powers. So once we have the formal and material causes of a thing, we can begin to explain how that thing acts in the world, and how it's acted on in the world. And that will be an, an account that involves the active powers of that, of that entity, how it acts upon other things, and the passive powers, how it is affected by other things. Right? So, um, so this, this way of accounting for change in terms of the exercise of powers is what Aristotle calls efficient causation. So this is the third now of the four famous Aristotelian causes. So the Aristotelian model of causation does not seek to describe the change as simply conforming to some abstract law of nature, but rather tries to understand the changes as the expression of the formal and material causes of that particular thing. So here's the crucial thing. Aristotle conceives of time as being the product of change and not vice versa. So in the modern world, we tend to think that change is just being a different way at different times. So we assume that time is gonna be moving forward, right? We draw a little diagram on the, on, the, on the board where we've got space and time, and time is just a dimension. And then we plot motion you know, along that uh, time dimension. So as time changes, the location changes, and that's what we call change. But in Aristotle's picture, change comes before time. It's because things act upon other things and change them that time is able to go forward. And I think that's a very important and, and insightful way of thinking about this. So this um, Aristotelian conception of causation through the exercise of powers also opens up, it allows for the existence of exceptional situations. That is, it allows for situations in which the causal powers of a thing are frustrated by other things or distorted by the interference of other substances. So in other words, in an Aristotelian framework, we can make a distinction between the functioning of a thing and its malfunctioning. Functioning is a case where its, its powers are expressed without interference. Malfunctioning is a case in which those powers are, are damaged or interfered with or frustrated in some way, disabled. This is the uh, ancient and medieval concept of violence to, a, uh, to an entity. You do violence to it when you're not allowing it to express itself. Right? So this, um, this then leads to the th final notion of causation in Aristotle, which is that of teleology. So, um, I mean, the, the rap against Aristotle is that he wrongly projects human intentionality and purpose onto the inanimate world, onto the world of matter and, and chemistry and so on. And I think that's, that fundamentally misunderstands what's going on in Aristotle, because once you have the notion of causal powers in place, so things naturally act in a certain way or acted on a certain way, you already have teleology. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says this pretty clearly in the Summa Theologia in part one, question 44. Every agent acts for an end, that's the purpose or telos, because otherwise one thing would not follow more from an, than another from the action of an agent, unless it were by chance. 
So anytime you have non-chance, so anytime you have an agent, a, a kind of thing, acting on something else, right? So fire heats water, makes it boil. That's already teleology for, Arist for, for Aristotle, because the fire has the power to heat the water, cause it to boil. It has that power even if it's never brought into contact with any water at all. Right? Even if the fire is just sitting there in some part of the universe where there's no water, it still has the f power to heat water. Right? And so that's a kind of teleology that's already there. That is, the fire is already, in a sense, pointing towards this potential boiling, right? whether it happens or not. Um, David Armstrong is, and, and uh, George Molnar have pointed out that this is a kind of physical intentionality that comes as soon as you have powers in the picture. There's a, there's a sense in which things are about non-existent events once they have powers, or potentially non-existent events. And, uh, and then what Aristotle then argues is that the teleology that we see in biology, so when we talk about the eye has the function of seeing, the, the heart has the function, the purpose of pumping blood, those are just special cases in which you apply this larger picture to the biological realm. So it's not that we're taking biology and projecting it down upon the, the physical world. It's rather the right sort of understanding of the physical world then when applied to biology leads naturally to a picture of, bi of biological function and purpose as well. And um, many biologists will think that, um, that they've somehow left teleology behind and that we've moved into a purely reductionistic or you know, biochemical kind of model. But in fact, that's not the case, because when you look at what biologists are actually doing, they're, they're always looking for the function or the purpose of things. Right? When they talk about a protein being an enzyme, they're describing that protein in terms of what it does catalyzes a certain reaction, enables an uh, organism to extract energy from its environment in certain ways, right? Um, and, and likewise, as, as I mentioned, we talk about a, a part of the DNA as a gene, you're describing it in terms of its function or purpose, right? And so uh, when they say that, when people in biology think that uh, teleology is merely a heuristic device for discovering something else, but when you look at what that means, it means you're discovering more biological stuff, which means more teleology. So teleology never actually escapes that circle. You're not, uh, you're not getting more information about the world that's, that's outside of teleology. You're just getting more information about function and purpose. And that remains true in, the modern, in modern biology as well as uh, in uh, ancient biology as well. Okay, so finally, last, last piece of Aristotle. And that's real agency at, at multiple levels. So in Aristotle's picture of the world, you have things that are called substances. That's the usual translation. Uh, the Greek word is usei, right? And these usia or usia, usei are the fundamental entities that make up the world, the things that everything else depends upon. And again, in Aristotle's picture, you find these substances at different levels of scale. So it's not that the fundamental entities are just the smallest particles that make up the world, but an organism can be a substance as well. And what it means to be a substance, again, is it means that you have a form. Right? That gives, that is an expression of a certain essence, and that is the basis of the causal powers of that organism. And that explains, the, in, our, in the case of human beings, the, uh, the uh, macroscopic behavior that we have. So the human being, as such, for instance, has special rational powers that make us sensitive to the true values of things, to objective values of things, and to act accordingly. So for Aristotelians, the human soul, or the human mind, is one of these cases of form. Right, the form of a particular living human body. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. It's not, uh, the Aristotelian picture is not dualistic in the sense that the soul and the body are somehow two separate and independent entities that interact with each other. It's rather that the soul is, is the essence that makes the human body a living human body in the first place. Now, this doesn't mean that uh, human beings can't survive death, as it turns out. Uh, Aristotelians like Thomas Aquinas have argued that, that we can on the grounds that the human soul, human form, is capable of exer exercising certain activities like contemplating universal truths that don't depend on the body's organs. Right? And that, that really dis dis differentiates us from other animals and plants, where the form of other animals and plants is cons completely consumed by the activities that involve the, the bodies of the animal and plant. But human beings are unique in that respect, that we, don't, we have activities that go beyond that, and that makes it possible for our form to exist apart from the body, I think. Okay, so anyway, that's the Aristotelian background. Now, what happens? Um, well, of course, there's the scientific revolution, but even before that, already in the late Middle Ages, shortly after the death of Thomas Aquinas, um, you see Western Europeans begin to abandon all these elements of the Aristotelian picture. Uh, it begins with Duns Scotus already, who uh, replaces Aristotle's notion of matter and form as two things that have to be defined in terms of each other, with a notion of matter as such, as though we could just find matter out there uh, doing its thing independent of form. 
Um, secondly, they replaced Aristotle's model of interlocking causal powers, active and passive causal powers, with the idea, and, and the idea of time as the measure of change. They replaced that with the idea of abstract laws of motion and a fixed and independent temporal dimension, as I mentioned before. And then thirdly, as a consequence of this, they abandoned Aristotle's formal and final causation and limited teleology to conscious agents and to their impulses and purposes as well. So let me go through those real quickly. Uh, first of all, they um, introduced the idea of matter as such. So as I mentioned, for Aristotle, matter is always the matter of something, right? And it is what it is because of the form that's interacting with that matter, right? Uh, in, in the late Middle Ages, Scotus and Occam and others start thinking about matter as though it were just a kind of thing of its own sort, with its own nature, that could act on its own. And, um, and once you do that, then you're beginning to create a more dualistic picture of the world, which you've got matter that does its thing independently of the realm of form and purpose and essence on the other side. The second crucial step, and this already begins with Descartes, and then of course gets picked up by Newton and others, is to replace the idea of causal powers with abstract laws of motion. Right? So you, you all know the Newton's four laws of motion, right? It's a way of describing phenomena without attributing causal powers to anything, but just, just pointing out how matter moves, right, characteristically, and describing it in, in, this, in this abstract sort of mathematical way. And of course, from this perspective, you never ask, why is time moving forward? It just does, right? Time's just sort of inexorably flowing forward, and then the laws of nature are somehow being carried along by time and sort of moving the matter around uh, in a way. So it, it's, it's as if, it's as if all the power in the world gets sucked out of things and put into the laws of nature. So the laws are now actually moving stuff around as, as time passes. Um, now, what about the inherent causal dispositions of, of matter? Well, Descartes actually tried to do, tried to have a model in which matter has no nature, no qualitative character at all. So all matter is uniform, right? So he had a picture where the world is just full of this completely nondescript stuff that then just moves around by mathematical motions. Well, that turned out to be wrong. We discovered gravity, and then later we discovered electromagnetism, and so we discovered that, in fact, matter comes in different kinds, uh, different kinds of densities, positive and negative charge, and so on, none of which really fits into the modern picture. It, it's, a, it's a recovery, to some extent, of Aristotle's picture already. Um, so this also reflects the pragmatism of Descartes and Francis Bacon. So uh, in this early period, there was a shift from thinking about science as a way of just of contemplating nature, understanding nature, to beginning to, to emphasize controlling nature for our own purposes. And if you're controlling nature, you don't really care so much about what the thing's essence is or what its purpose is. You just want to know, how can I make it do what I want it to do? And you, you, there's a lot of quotes I could give you here from Bacon and others who say, uh, the Aristotelian, the scholastic attention to try to understand things gets in the way of science, because science should just be about power. Science should just be about controlling nature. Uh, so that, that, that was, I think, part of this as well. Uh, we get the rejection of, um, sorry, let me go back here a minute. Yeah, the rejection of formal and final causation that I just mentioned. Um, so we don't need to talk about form, especially we don't need to think, think about form of composite things anymore, because composite things now are just made up of matter. We can understand matter in its own terms. We can run it through these mathematical laws of motion. And we don't need to talk about form. We don't need to talk about essence. We don't need to talk about substance anymore at, at the level of above the microscopic, right? Um, and therefore, there's no, no need for teleology. So what happens to teleology? Well, what happens, of course, is that philosophers realize that human beings exist, and we seem to have purposes. We have, we have desires. We, we try to do things. And so what happens is you get a dualistic or fragmented world. You get a world of matter, which is just brute, uniform stuff that has no powers, no essence, no form, and just moves around according to mathematical laws. And then you have human beings, or the soul, or something like that. And that's full of meaning and purpose, and, and so on. And then, of course, this creates a huge problem, which is how do you then put these two things back together again, right? Um, and Descartes was, was troubled with this, and many others were as well. Um, you end up with a kind of mind-body or matter-soul dualism that can no longer be uh, stitched together. 
And so we end up with what we might call the soul of the gaps problem, right? So uh, as long as we could, didn't understand everything that's going on in the body, we could always say maybe the soul interferes with the pineal gland or does something with neurons. But the more we learn about the body, the more we learn about how it functions, it seems there's less and less room for the soul. And soul gets kind of pushed out of the picture. And this, this leads, I think, inevitably to the development of a kind of materialistic, physicalistic picture of the world, where the soul ultimately just disappears. We've got nothing but matter. And that's, in effect, a shorthand uh, version of the history of, of philosophy up to, up to the present time. Okay, so um, what we end up with then is a kind of triumph of what I call microphysicalism. And this is the idea that every truth, ultimately, causal and otherwise, of the macroscopic world that we're all familiar with, people and tools and so on, it's all wholly grounded in and explained by the microphysical facts. So really the microphysical stuff is in charge, right? We're just kind of jetsam and flotsam that's floating along on top of the surface of it, right? And uh, this license is ultimately what we call reduction, the reduction of macroscopic things to microscopic stuff, right? So that we end up falling out of the picture. And you get this sort of grand reductionist narrative that develops in the 19th century, early 20th century, right? You can reduce politics and social science to psychology, psychology to biology, biology to chemistry, chemistry to atomic physics, atomic physics to particle physics. So ultimately everything just collapses down to that, that ultimate microscopic level. Now, um, I think this is an unsatisfying picture of the world, and a lot of philosophers have recognized that, including Plato, uh, who puts into, into the mouth of Socrates in the, in the Phaedo this sort of complaint, where you know, Socrates is now on trial, well, he's, he's been convicted of, of uh, corrupting the youth, he's about to uh, uh, take the poison, his friends try to convince him to leave, uh, to escape Athens, and he says, no, I'm not going to because I think it's best for me to stay in Athens, even if I have to die, because I'm an Athenian, and it's my duty to stay here. And so, we get into an interesting discussion then about what explains Socrates' behavior. Why is Socrates sitting there and not going to Thebes or somewhere else? And, and Socrates says, look, it would be absurd to say that the reason I'm not going to Thebes is because my sinews and nerves are snitched, knit, knit together in a certain way and they're keeping me here, right? It's obvious that I'm not leaving because I think it's best not to leave, right? That there's some kind of objective truth out there about value which is affecting me as a person and keeping me here in Athens, right? But the modern microphysicalist picture has to say, no, Socrates, you're wrong. It is your nerves and your sinews and so on, right? Uh, the stuff that you're talking about isn't, can't really make a difference because we've already explained everything in terms of the motions of the matter. And the matter has no purpose and no function. It's not sensitive to values, right? So, um, so the microphysical this picture is deeply in tension with our understanding of ourselves as, as human beings, as beings that are capable of responding to, to real value. Um, now, what, what can the materialist do? Really, the materialist has to go one of three ways here, I think. They can either just say, well, there are no objective values, Socrates, so there's no problem, right? Yes, you are getting pushed around by your neurons and so on, but that's because there are no objective values for you to be responding to in the first place, right? Uh, now, it turns out that philosophers, including one of my colleagues, Jonathan Dancy and Christ Christina Gorsgaard and others, have made some very powerful arguments that that can't make any sense that there can't be subjective values unless there's objective value, right? Because if you say, well, the, it's, it's, you know, it's subjectively good for me to, to be here because I like California weather, let's say, um, well, you've got, that only makes sense if it's objectively good for human beings to do what they like, right? Or to, to enjoy what they like. There has to, at some point, you've got to get down to objective values. Uh, secondly, you could say that uh, somehow um, we make decisions based on values, even though there's no connection between us and the world of value, right? So that's another sort of picture where, yes, there are objective values that are out there, but we're trapped in the material world, where we can't interact with those values, we can't really respond to those values. And that, again, leads to a kind of nihilism, right? Where we, we're faced with the fact that, although there's a thing we should be doing, we can't do it. Or finally, we could, we could try to argue that somehow these real objective values that Socrates is talking about are actually encoded in the physical world, so that the physical world itself is uh, the truth maker, the thing that makes it true that he should stay in Athens. But that is uh, frankly absurd, because facts about where the matter is and how it's arranged in his body can't possibly be the ground for it's being good for him to be in Athens, right? There's just a, a grammatical kind of gap there that, that can't, be, uh, can't be filled. So, as I said, this leads to uh, a kind of triumph of uh, microphysicalism. But, so far, things look pretty grim, right? So we've got, um, we've got uh, 
lost everything that Aristotle gave us, and we've forced into a situation in which human life is sort of impossible, right? Because we live in a material world that's really hostile to us. So the good news is we've got the quantum revolution. It happens about 100 years ago. It starts with uh, Planck and Einstein and others, and then develops uh, in, the, in the 20s. So here we find um, what I call the revenge of teleology. So teleology actually comes back after being repressed for hundreds of years. We get non-separable states and entanglement. And that's going to show us that microphysicalism is wrong, that you can't reduce holes to parts, that some holes are irreducible. Thirdly, we get the measurement problem, which I'll explain in a bit. That, that's the really crucial one, I think, that shows that if the quantum revolution is right, physics can't be the whole story. Physics can't exhaust reality. And then finally, the, the reification again of potentiality and actuality, which are the sort of key ideas in Aristotle. And once you've restored potentiality and actuality into the story, into the picture, you get powers, you get teleology, you get everything else that we would want. You get substances again at the macroscopic level. So these are, these are all good news. Uh, teleology. So in, the, in classical mechanics, there's two ways to do it. You can do it by differential equations, and you can do it by integral equations. You can use the sort of Newtonian model, where you, you're using laws of motion based on, on forces. So Newton's picture is the kind of push-me-pull-you kind of model. You have forces that are pushing things around, and there, that produces acceleration, which we express by these differential equations. And that's how, you, that's how you, 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 you explain the motion of things. The other approach is the Hamiltonian sort of approach, where you use integral equations. And instead of, instead of thinking about forces, you look at the total total energy of the system. And you ask yourself, what sort of path will minimize the total action, which, is a, which is, depends on the energy of the system over time? So in fact, what you're doing is you're looking at how the system behaves as a whole, holistically, over time, by, by picking out the best path in a certain way, the path that, that has the least action, that is optimal in some respect. So in, in, in classical physics, you can do it either way, and they're, they're provably equivalent. They're two different ways of modeling motion. And what physicists had thought until the quantum revolution was that Newton had the basic idea right, that Newton was explaining what's really going on. There are forces out there, and they're pushing these little things around. Right? The Hamiltonian stuff is just a nice shortcut. It works, and it's cool, but it doesn't really express physical reality. Well, when you go to the quantum revolution, it turns out that the Newtonian differential equation model completely drops out. You can't use it anymore. You have to use the Hamiltonian integral model. So that means that teleology is now not just a heuristic, it's the whole ballgame. It's the thing that's driving what's happening. And so it's holistic, it's teleological, it's not forces, being, forces pushing things around in the, in the old Newtonian model. Um, second crucial discovery, non-separable states or entanglements. So I'm going to talk about this one a little bit, uh, in a little more detail. Um, Schrodinger uh, regarded quantum entanglement as the characteristic trait of quantum mechanics, and that enforces its entire departure from classical lines of thought. So when two systems are entangled in quantum mechanics, two particles, let's say, let's just keep it simple, are entangled, then the, the description of what's going on is what we call non-separable, which means you can't describe what's going on by telling me what's going on with particle A, what's going on with particle B, and how, what's, what's the distance between them. You have to describe the whole system as a whole. Right? That's what the entanglement means. It, it can't be separated into these three parts, A, B, and the distance between them, or the, or the relative velocity. And that's, of course, radically different from the Newtonian and Maxwellian kind of picture, where everything's separable. You just tell me what's going on here, you tell me what's going on there, and that's the whole story, right? Just do that exhaustively. Quantum mechanics says, no, it doesn't work. It's impossible to recover the whole by looking just at the parts individually. And that's a revolutionary idea. Um, I'll talk a little bit here about the Einstein uh, uh, Posen Rose, uh, uh, EPR thought experiment that Einstein and two other people came up with. Um, Einstein actually produced this as a way of showing that quantum mechanics has to be false that it's got to be wrong, because here's something that would happen that's sort of obviously wrong. And, from, and I think the reason Einstein thought it was obviously wrong is he was approaching it from this classical, quasi-Newtonian approach, right? That is, he, was, he, was, he thought holes have to be reducible to their parts, right? And that's what the EPR experiment is sort of showing. So in the EPR, you've got two particles, uh, and each particle is, is spinning. And they're either spinning up or down along a particular dimension, right? And they're, they're physically separated. So one of the particles could be 
in our galaxy, another one could be in the Andromeda galaxy, or even further away. There's, there's, no, there's no distance limit here to the entanglement that's possible. But somehow they're, they're entangled. And what we get is, the, is, the, is this equation, which tells us that there's a certain probability that um, one particle is up and the other is down, and another probability that one is down and the other is up. So they, they're, they're anti-correlated. They, uh, they can't both be up and they can't both be down, right? But if you ask which one's up, which one's down, the answer is both and neither, right? That is, uh, they're both sort of up and both sort of down, but in this weird sort of anti-correlated kind of way. And then when you observe one particle, this is the little experiment here, uh, you will see a certain result. And once you see the result here, you know what the result on the other side has to be. So if I see it go up here, I know the other one's down. If I see it goes down here, I know the other one goes up, right? But it turns out that if you look at the statistics of this over time, and I don't really have time to explain this, it turns out that you can't think of this as though there was some chance event occurred here, which made one up and one down, and then we just discovered it here. And once we discover it here, we know what's going on there. It turns out that's impossible. That that's what, what's going on here leaves both particles in what's called a superposition, that is partly up, partly down, right? And then here, one of them, when I, when I observe it, do the measurement, it's somehow forced to go up or down. And once it goes up, that forces the other one to go down. If this one goes down, that forces the other one to go up simult simultaneously, right? Without any causal interaction between the two. That's what Einstein said, okay, that's impossible. It couldn't possibly happen. And now uh, we've actually done experiments called the aspect experiments that show, no, Einstein's wrong. This does actually happen. Uh, there's a been a, it's also been some work that's done by, um, um, let's see, um, uh, I've, forgotten, I've forgotten the name, actually, but there's been proof that, that this is, um, there's a statistical, yeah, here we go. It's the uh, Bell, right? John Bell uh, proved this, this theorem, and uh, what he showed was that if locality is respected, which is, which is separability, right? If what goes on in one place is separable from what goes on in the other place, then the probability of what you see on the A side, right, is going to be independent of what you, what's going on on the B side if you fix the common cause, which is the lambda. So lambda is that common cause where you start out from the original uh, preparation. And this is the result in B and this is the result in A. And if there's locality, then this probability should be independent of B, right? And likewise, this probability should be independent of A. And what uh, Bell shows is that in quantum mechanics, those probabilities are violated. Those, I those identities are violated. And that shows that uh, you can't explain what's happening in terms of local events traced back to some common cause. Instead, what you have is a complete holistic system, widely separated in space, right? which is a, irreducibly a whole. It's not, it's the whole is, is necessarily more than the sum of the parts. That's what they've discovered. And that is something which an Aristotelian can take into, into his stride, because in Aristotelian picture, you have composite substances that are extended in space, they have an essence, they have a form, which uh, affects the separated parts of that substance, right, in such a way that the whole is greater than the parts. So it's very much the same kind of picture that uh, Aristotle was, uh, was aiming for. Okay, uh, that get, let's, takes us then to the measurement problem. I should say this, yeah, so the only way out here, if you want to be anti-Aristotelian is, you have to assume that there's instantaneous action at a distance. So that when I make the observation on the one side, that somehow causes instantaneously on the other side of the universe, right, uh, a change in the other particle. And physicists, I think, rightly think that that doesn't make any sense. You can't have that kind of instantaneous action. So if you avoid instantaneous action, then you have to think of the two particles as part of a single inseparable whole not two parts that are somehow separated and that somehow interact with each other over time. Okay, so let's talk about the measurement problem now. So um, when you look at the details of, of quantum mechanics, what it does is it doesn't ever assign any definite properties to any of the individual particles uh, or any definite values to parameters. So if I ask about any particular particle in quantum mechanics, you know, where is it? What's its motion? Quantum, the quantum formalism doesn't give us any answer. What it does instead is it assigns probabilities to a whole infinite range of possible results. So each particle has the possibility of being anywhere in the universe with a certain probability. And that's all the quantum mechanics tells us. And so it doesn't tell us um, 
uh, it doesn't tell us, well, what it does tell, it tells us what, what do these probabilities mean. The probabilities mean that if you make a measurement of that particle, you will discover it here with a certain percent of probability, 50% here, 30% here, 20% over there, let's say, right? But what do those probabilities mean? They're probabilities of a certain measurement being obtained. But what's a measurement? Quantum mechanics doesn't tell us. There's nothing in the theory that says what a measurement is. Right? It, it just gives us a bunch of probabilities for something, and it can't tell us what that probability is. Right? What it, the probability of what? Right? And so the early people in the Copenhagen uh, approach, Bohr in particular, said, OK, so there are just two worlds. There's this macroscopic, sort of classical world, and then there's a quantum world, and the two just don't mix. They're two completely separate realms. Well, already, that's a huge blow to the physicalist picture of the world. Because now you're saying that the quantum mechanical description of the world is not the whole world, necessarily. It's only describing the, mi mi the quantum realm. It's not telling us anything about the uh, macroscopic well realm. Uh, let me give you an example here of the kind of problem that you get into. You may have heard of Schrodinger's cat, right? So um, suppose that we assume that the measurement is just going to be some other physical system. So, Quantum mechanics describes these physical systems. We then say, okay, the measurement is just going to be another physical system that interacts with the first physical system and gives us a result. Right? Now, what's the problem? Right? Well, here's the problem, Schrodinger's cat. So uh, suppose that we set up the cat in such a way that there's a certain probability that the, the atom decays. And if it decays, it'll break this flask, and the cat dies from the fumes. Right? Uh, so let's say there's a 50% chance the poor cat dies, 50% chance the cat lives. Okay? Well, if the cat is itself a sum of a bunch of quantum particles, just like the thing in the, in the uh, detector, and just like the fumes, then what quantum mechanics actually tells us is not there's a 50% chance the cat dies and a 50% chance it lives. It tells us the cat is both dead and alive at the end of the process, right? That is, it says there's a 50% chance that if you look at the cat, it will be dead, and a 50% chance that if you look at the cat, you will be alive. Well, who's looking at the cat, right? Not another physical system, because if you throw another physical system in there, like us, we get trapped in the same thing. We become both alive and dead. We, we've, we become both seeing a cat alive and seeing a cat dead at the same time, right? Uh, this, is, this is what's called the Wigner friend paradox, right? Which is, if you have one person making an observation at some quantum level, then you've got to have somebody else observing him to see what the result was. But then, of course, you'll need another person observing that person to observe and see what his result is ad infinitum, right? And so you never, you're never able to escape this quantum indeterminacy. There's no, there's no measurement that's possible in this picture. Okay, now, what's the, prob what's the answer? So if you're a materialist, there's very few answers here, really. And one that's very popular now is what's called the Everett Many Worlds answer. So Many Worlds now is not... Um, it's not a theory that, uh, it's not a multiverse theory. It's actually weirder than the multiverse theory, right? <laughs> Much weirder, right? Because it says that when I make a quantum observation, I actually split into two versions, one of whom sees the dead cat, one of whom sees the live cat, right? And if I make another observation, I split again into other things. So in fact, everybody is constantly splitting according to this theory, into multiple versions of oneself. And, uh, and so I've already, there's already trillions of me out there doing all kinds of wild things. Looking into the future, there'll be more trillions of me doing lots of other weird things in the future. And nobody that I can identify and say, that's me in the future. I will be equally all of them, according to the Many Worlds picture. Um, so this is the only way to save something like locality, something like um, physicalism as the total story, is to embrace something like the Many Worlds picture. Now, um, the problem, though, even so, there's a problem, right? Because if you look at the quantum theory itself, there's no worlds in that theory, and there's no splitting. There's absolutely nothing in the theory that says splitting. What you have, again, is, is a probability wave that's fluctuating. And it doesn't tell you where the probability is moving or that it's splitting into different parts. It just describes all these different states occurring at, at the same time in different ways. So we, 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 we can't even get... We can't even solve the measurement problem this way without adding something to quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics itself doesn't give us the branching. So we still have, we still have the problem. Now, the Oxford Everettians, which is a new group, they say, they say that we can solve this problem by thinking of the macroscopic world as a kind of projection, right? So we look at the quantum wave, and we can extract from it uh, possible models 
of a macroscopic world, a way of mathematically projecting our familiar world onto the quantum formalism in such a way that you get these multiple branches. Right? So it's possible to do that, right? Um, but the, there's, a, there's a price to be paid. Um, first of all, there's the problem of probability. Right? So the quantum mechanics tells us that there's a certain probability will go one way and a certain probability the other way. It might be 75-25. Okay? On the many worlds picture, the problem is all the different versions have probably won. They all will absolutely happen, right? Both the one that's 75 and then the one that's 25. So what sense does it make to say that one's 75% and one's 25% likelihood? Um, David Wallace at Oxford has tried to solve this by going back to the foundations of probability theory, uh, th work that Ramsey and Savage and others done, to try to show that to be a rational agent, you must act as though quantum probabilities are probabilities. That's, that's a strategy. But the problem with Wallace's work is, I think, Wallace's work actually refutes the many worlds picture, whereas he thinks it verifies it. Because the problem is that Wallace's theory only works if you assume that we can't care about trans world or trans branch values, right? That, that is one of the crucial assumptions called the sure thing principle, which means that when I'm looking at the future, I have to think of the, uh, the expected utility of my different versions of myself, and I can't, I can't um, value things that, that cross across, that go across branches or worlds. I have to do it atomistically. Look at this state, that state, that state, and so on, and then add them up, right? But why, why is that the case? I mean, if, I, if I'm actually thinking about the fact that I might have, let's say, a dozen future versions of myself, right, as a result of this talk, then I might think, well, I kind of like equality, so I want to make sure that my 12 versions end up more or less equal to each other. I mean, you might like that, right? And if you did, you would violate the savage principle, and you would screw up Wallace's proof. His proof would fall apart. So Wallace has to assume that it's irrational to do that. It just doesn't make any sense to do that. But the only reason it doesn't make sense to do that is because we really believe that only one of those worlds will actually happen. Right? And so it's what I call the value supervenes on being principle. Right? Only one of those things will actually happen. And so it doesn't make any sense for me to say, well, I'm going to care about what, not only what actually happens, but also what would have happened and how it compares to what actually happens. Well, that wouldn't make any sense. Right? I mean, all you care about is the actual result, but that requires you to believe in one world, not many worlds. Right? Okay, so, um, so that's the desperate result. There's one more problem that uh, Oxford gets into, and that is, um, yeah, here's the many worlds splitting. It's much worse than that. Uh, the other thing that it gets into is um, that the Everettian can't explain what it is for our familiar world to emerge from the quantum world. So what actually turns out, and I've, in my paper in the, in the book that uh, Matthew mentioned, I show that if you say that the, our familiar world, what we might call the manifest image of ordinary life, is to be found somehow in the quantum mechanical world by this kind of projection, you can show that by equal logic, any consistent story whatsoever can be found in the quantum world as well. So in other words, the world of uh, Harry Potter, the world of the Lord of the Rings, they're all there just as much as we are, right? They're all equally, as long as it's a consistent story and consistent with the uh, quantum mechanics itself and also consistent with, uh, well, there's some technicalities about the size of the universe, uh, how many, how many, uh, whether it's an infinite number of things or not. But, you know, Harry Potter doesn't say anything about that, so, so Harry Potter's fine. So Harry Potter world is just as, wor as real on the Oxford Everettian picture as our world is. They're all equally there in the quantum realm. And that's obviously wrong, right? I mean, there's got to be some kind of difference. So what's the answer? The answer is Aristotle, right? Um, that is, why is our world real and Harry Potter world not real? Because reality contains certain essences certain forms, the form of human beings and aardvarks and water, not the form of mithril and unicorns and so on, right? And so that's why our world is really there in the quantum formulation, and these other imaginary worlds are not, because there's a fixed number of essences there, which are actualizing the potentialities of the quantum world in a certain way, right? And once you add that to the picture, then, um, this also solves the many worlds problem. How do we get one world back? Well, if there are forms or essences in the world, then when we get that split, right, that produces the many worlds in the, in the uh, um, Everett picture, what's really going on here is there's some essence, let's say the essence of the atomic source or the essence of the fume, which 
actualizes one of these two potentialities and not the other. Right? So it's the Aristotelian form or essence that does the actualizing, that chooses one of the quantum branches over the others. The reason that quantum mechanics, physicists in quantum mechanics haven't seen this is because they've lost the distinction between actuality and potentiality long ago. They think there's just the actual world. They can't see the possibility that there might be real potentialities there that forms are actualizing in one way and not the other. And once you add that back to the picture, then the whole thing is actually very, very clear. There's no mystery about the quantum mechanics. So quantum mechanics is only mysterious and weird if you come to it with physicalistic presuppositions. Right? When you come to it with Aristotelian presuppositions, it's simple, it's clear. So I, I like to say that you know, quantum mechanics, if, if we could have somehow skipped directly from Newton's to quantum mechanics in the 17th century, people would have seen Aristotle was right all along. We never would have lost Aristotle. Uh, it's only that, uh, the fact that we were a little confused by that intervening period that we lost that Aristotelian uh, insight. So that means that, that means that this has implications for human free choice as well. Because it means that human beings, we have powers at the human level. Quantum mechanics throws up to us these possibilities for the future, right? So in a sense, there is the splitting, and there are these trillion versions of me, but only one of them is actual. And the one that's actual is the one that I actualize by exercising my powers, by actualizing one of those potentialities rather than the others, right? And that's what the many worlds people are missing. They don't understand that there's that distinction between actual and potential, and that form can be the thing that fills the gap between those. Um, and this is, the, this is why I mentioned this very last, the reification of, of potentiality. And um, I think it was Heisenberg who recognizes that this is crucial. Um, in Aristotle's metaphysics, potentiality is just as real as actuality. I'm almost done, so I know it's been, you've been very patient with me. I appreciate it. Um, one of the crucial ideas in Aristotle in, in the metaphysics is that being is said in many ways. There are many ways of being. And in particular, there's the way of being actual and the way of being potential. And they're both real. They're both part of reality. With the scientific revolution, Newton and Descartes and others thought, we can get rid of potentiality. There's just the actual world and the laws of physics that determine the actual world. And all these possibilities are merely mental models. Not, there's nothing in the real world that corresponds to them. Quantum mechanics says that can't be right. right? There has to be this plurality in the world, in reality itself, beyond the realm of, of, uh, of merely mental models. And by restoring potentiality and teleology and holism, quantum mechanics reopens in the question of the efficacy of sensation, desire, and rational thought. All of that then becomes possible, because now it's not just the microscopic stuff that's determining everything. There's a room for the macroscopic form of human beings to make a real difference at the microscopic level. To solve the measurement problem, we have to bring back Aristotelian form in order to cut down the number of possible emergent worlds, to get rid of Harry Potter and leave the, the real ones, and also to explain why we get one world when the quantum mechanic, mechanical uh, system is, is branching with these various possibilities. So um, we can also describe this as a kind of quantum pluralism. And Nancy Cartwright, uh, who's a great uh, philosopher of physics in, in Britain, has been arguing that we should be quantum realists in a way, that we take the quantum state seriously. I want to be a quantum realist, too. So I'm not saying you know, quantum mechanics is bunk, it's unreal. It's, it's very much real. And it's crucial to my story that it be real. But it's also that quantum mechanics points to the fact that it's not the whole story. It, says, it's, it sort of demonstrates that it can't be the whole story. There has to be more to the world than just quantum mechanics. And so that leads to this kind of pluralism in which we can make room for chemistry, thermodynamics, biology, psychology, and so on to make real contributions to the world over and above the quantum mechanical level. Uh, and uh, Feyerabend uh, says something similar, uh, that the, he calls this generalized quantum theory. That means adapting quantum mechanics in different ways in different fields. So this is another area I've been working at recently, is looking at quantum chemistry and the ways in which quantum chemistry already is pointing to the fact that you get these Aristotelian substances at the chemical level already, even before you get to organisms. And so even at that level, there's more going on than you can get at the, at the microscopic level. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.